Let us pray. Lord, even as the lyric you just sang said, Come down, O love divine. Visit thou this soul of mine, and kindle it by holy flame bestowing. Open our hearts and our minds to your presence, O Lord, today. Make room in us to receive that which you desire. Work in us what pleases you. And so we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated for me. Um, as many of you know, my wife and I have five sons who are living in different places in and around the United States. And we pray for them. And in fact, my wife and I pray together pretty much every morning. Uh, we name the kids by name. And if there's something going on with each one of them, which is there almost always is with somebody, you know how that is. Uh, we're praying about that. Uh, we pray for each other. And a part of what we pray, especially, is that God would use us over the course of that day, whatever it is that he wants us to do. Because you see, what I think of, when I think of the Christian life, and what it means especially for these who are being presented to be confirmed and want to be received, is a commitment to service. In other words, I'm a part of the essence of what it means to be a confirmed Christian, is someone who is willing to say, I'm ready to do the service, the service, notice that's the word, even in the liturgy, the service that you have asked of me. In other words, my function in life now, as someone who has been confirmed, is to be available for God to use me in any way that God chooses to see fit. It could be anything. My job, therefore, is to be open. To be open for what I call divine appointments. All of the scriptures this morning, Old Testament, Epistle and Gospel are in fact all about divine appointments. Sometimes there are divine appointments of which they are aware. Others, they're not. You only kind of recognize it in hindsight. Oh, that's what all of that meant when it fell together the way it did. Didn't see it at the time, but when you look back on it, you can see how it was woven together in a way that actually made sense. Some divine appointments we don't even recognize, don't know we're a part of, and won't know until we actually stand before God at the very end of our life, when we've been ushered into eternity, into a new eternal life. And as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, he says, Then I shall know, even also as I am known. In other words, just as thoroughly as God knows me, at that moment, I will know and understand things that I never knew. Do you have a list? One day when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God about it. The promise is, is that you'll know God will show you the things about, and, and really all of your life and the life around you from God's perspective. I am excited about divine appointments. I, I look forward to it because to me, quite honestly, that's actually the fun of what it means to be a Christian. It, it, if your Christian life is about just getting by or working hard to stay good, it, it seems to me, I think you're missing it. You're missing out, quite honestly. Because the Christian life is bigger than that. And in fact, it's much, it's much more others-focused. You, you see, if you notice the words that I used about surviving and trying to be good, the focus of that orientation is about me. I'm trying to survive. I'm trying to be good. It's about me and my life, in other words. And that, quite honestly, is the culture in which we live. We live in a culture that is completely absorbed, quite honestly, with our personal life and how I'm getting along. So it takes something, nothing less than miraculous, to be committed to a different kind of life, a different kind of orientation, to say that my life today, Sunday, or Monday, tomorrow, What's the point of today? The point of today is to be available in the midst of the ordinary routines that I'm a part of. In other words, this doesn't mean I'm going to go to Africa. You know, you might. 
but quite honestly, for most of us, it has everything to do with being who God wants us to be where we live. Among our family, among our friends, our business associates, our neighbors, to be with them. And in the midst of that, to be open to the possibility that God actually might want to use you in some way in the life of another person. That's really the essence of what I mean when I talk about a divine appointment. That God, in fact, might open a door that He wants to use you. And so the point is, you become available. And again, some of which you might be aware of it, some of which you might not. It, it actually doesn't matter, except that there are those opportunities when the door begins to open, and you know it, and you have a choice to make. <coughs> Am I going to speak out? And it can be the smallest of things. I mean, when we have a friend of ours who gets sick, what is the culturally appropriate thing to say? Well, I'll be thinking about you. It takes a little bit more courage to say, if you'd like, I'll be happy to pray for you. You see, that's very different, isn't it? Both in its tone, because there's some gravity to it. I'll be praying for you if you'd like. <clears throat> But it's, that's what I mean. It's just taking, sometimes it's the smallest of steps. Being sensitive to write a note. Choosing to be honest no matter what, even if it costs you. When I was talking with those who were being confirmed before the service, I said, you know what's courageous, what you're doing? It's not a small thing. It's actually quite important. To say that you will be available for God to use you, regardless of what that might look like. To be available for God in His service. That's the essence of confirmation. I want to say to you, that's the essence of what it means to be a Christian. Notice at the very beginning. Look, turn with me here if you want. Just a couple things to which I want to call your attention. If you look at the contemporary version of the collect. Now, stop a minute. Collects most of which were penned by Thomas Cranmer, but not exclusively, are written, in essence, to collect the thoughts of the scriptures for that day and to express them within the framework of a prayer. That's the point. And so we have a collect for every single Sunday. And most of the time, not always, but most of the time, the collect and the lessons all line up. And they are meant to provide a lens through which we read the scriptures. And the key phrase in this collect, there are two. One has to do with what has happened to us in Christ. What has God done? He has wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature. That's very important in our culture. That doesn't think very much, quite honestly, about the dignity of human nature. It's much more about being useful than it is being necessarily of value. In other words, what is the value of someone according to much of our culture? It's what I can do, <coughs> not necessarily who I am, which makes a lot of people driven perfectionists because they know that on their job, they're expendable if they don't perform, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of how we live these days. So to talk about God doing something that literally restores the dignity of human nature, it says something very important about who I am and who we are. That the fact that we belong to Christ and the Holy Spirit is living in us because we are Christians actually should cause us in some ways to square our shoulders a little bit. To walk with a level of dignity and purpose that says that I'm more than what commercials on TV say I am. And in fact, many of those messages are actually quite contrary to what it means to walk as a Christian with this kind of grace and dignity. It's not snobbery, just the opposite. It's a kind of gentle confidence that God gives you in who He is making you and what you are called to be. Not just what you're called to do, but what you're called to be. Because He has said something wonderful about you. If He chooses in His love to literally pour His Holy Spirit into the very center of your being and to call you beloved, that's extraordinary. There's no one else in the entire universe who does that. That is a unique action that God does that gives us that kind of dignity. But then the other phrase 
is, grant that we may share the divine life of him. And we talked about that actually some last night at the contemporary service. To share the divine life means to be available because the life of God is given us. To be a vessel that God uses for that divine life to be expressed through us in and with the lives of other people. That's the issue of divine greatness. In other words, whether it's the smallest of actions, the I'll be praying for you, those things that fall under the sim symbolism of even if you give a cup of cold water in my name, you will not lose your reward. The small things, the courtesies, the kindnesses that are meant, not just, oh, I've got to do it, you know, but it's because you actually care about somebody. It's the small things, or sometimes it's actually the big things. Speaking out in a way that might cost you. Uh, choosing to financially, sacrificially give into the life of another person because of the need. Even if it actually costs you personally to do so. To speak up in a way that might actually even get you in a little bit of trouble. To think carefully about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? And how, what does that look like? So you actually begin to take seriously the commandments of God the things that the scripture teaches, and you're really wrestling, how do I find a way to live this out? If I'm supposed to share the divine life, it's real clear what it looks like, but that doesn't look like me. So how do I get there, God? Show me what that means. And I want to tell you, God will help you. He will show you what exactly that means to live out, to share this divine life. Let me give you a couple of examples. And here's the thing. Because each of us is unique in terms of personality, in terms of the way that we've been formed, how that divine life gets expressed will be different from person to person. It's not always the same. So when I tell you a couple of examples out of my life, I, please don't go, oh, well, I can't do that, therefore it doesn't mean, no, no, no. I, it just has everything to do with how you're gifted. Like, for example, my wife and I love having people over for dinner. It's hospitality. We love opening our home. Both of us love to cook. Farley's a phenomenal cook. I love to cook. We love having people here. And we build friendships, in fact. Uh, we've done, even in the diocese, we have clergy and spouses over as often as we can because we know that there are things that can happen over a dinner table that just can't happen in any other place. Southerners, you know what I mean. That's a gift that God has given us is that kind of hospitality. For some people, they think, if you have 25 people over your house for dinner, I could never do that in a million years. But for us, it's fun. You see, you're gifted in a particular way. And that's what you do. Another is, for example, when we're in restaurants. Uh, it happens pretty, pretty regularly. I find myself looking out and just starting to pray for somebody. Sometimes that's all I do. Sometimes I actually get up and go over. It's kind of scary. <laughs> and I, said, I introduced myself. And I said, you know, I just can't need to let you know that I, I've really been praying for you. Is there anything that I ought to be praying for? My wife and I were visiting our son's girlfriend's parents, I have to get this right, uh, in Charleston last week, South Carolina. And we were in a restaurant. This fellow was waiting on us. I just kept praying for him. I finally thought I didn't say something. So I got up from the table, and he was over there, sort of by the kitchen. And I introduced myself, and I said, I just want you to know, I've been praying for you. He said, that's the coolest thing anybody's ever said. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's going on? Guess what? He's getting ready to move to Korea. Oh. I said, well, I guess you need prayer notes. <laughs> And it always says, sometimes it doesn't work like that. So one time I remember that when some fellow inside I was praying for him, and he looked like he'd been struck by an electric shock. You know, he didn't know how to react at all. In other words, but the point is, is that you're available. That's really the point. You're available for God to use you. Because for God to use you in the life of another person is the essence of what it means to share the divine life. That's what it is. It has nothing to do with whether you feel good or bad. It has nothing to do with whether you're feeling at peace or not. Or it doesn't even necessarily mean that your life is going well. I mean, here's the story. Look at Jeremiah. First lesson, real quick. Jeremiah was always in a mess of trouble. 
I still remember my mother, who's a native of Mississippi, going to a Bible study when I was a kid in her Bible, her women's Bible study group and stuff, studying Jeremiah. She'd come home and she'd just shake her head. She'd say, poor old Jeremiah. Because every, I mean, his faithfulness to God as a prophet in the midst of Israel that was besieged by marauding armies, got him in jail, he was thrown in a pit at one point. I mean, his, he did not have what you and I would call a nice life in any way, shape, or form. And yet, he prophesied. God used him to speak extraordinary things to the nation of Israel. I mean, if you look at the lesson that was read, it's all about the future. There's nothing that was going on at that moment when this prophecy was being spoken about a well-ordered garden that he was going to gather people together, the women were going to dance and rejoice, and all the phenomenal things that are... There was nothing in their circumstances that would indicate that was ever going to happen. But God had divine appointments and plans for the nation of Israel. What I, God was using Jeremiah to do is to say to them, in the midst of that incredible difficulty, it's going to happen. Hang on. Be faithful. Now, look over, please, quickly to the epistles. The same, Ephesians. Because we've been given this divine life, because God has poured that life in us, we are the inheritors of an extraordinary treasure. And for us to be able to step out in that kind of courage means we need to have a sense of that inside of us. So that what Paul prays is that by at the beginning he talks about that you've been chosen. In other words, you are. The very fact that you are a Christian is a divine appointment. It's God's act. It didn't have to happen. He chose it to happen. You, he chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world. In other words, I belong to him, and the reason I belong to him is because God decided it. Not because I'm good enough. Don't ever fall over that track, because you're never good enough. No, it's because God decided it. And so in the midst of that divine appointment, he prays at the end, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will do what? Give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, so as you come to know him, so that the eyes of your heart is light. In other words, to, uh, your eyes to be open to what it is that he's given you so that you can step out with that kind of courage. If I know that I belong to Jesus and that it has everything to do with the fact that I've been forgiven, it's his action and he loves me, I can step out. If I don't know that, I'm afraid. I'll worry about what other people think of me. I won't have that kind of joy. I'll always be living in the era of, I'm not good enough to do this. And the kind of fear and condemnation, it really is the work of the evil one. It is not from God. Even if that condemnation has a religious, even a Christian, it comes out of another Christian, it's still not from God. Jesus speaks word of, words of life and hope and calls us to joy and to freedom. And believe me, if that's not happening, you're not hearing from God. Not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ anyway. And that God will arrange things in a way that's incredible, even though you may not see it. That's actually the story of the Matthew lesson. Here's Jesus. There's genocide going on. They are refugees. And yet, God is using all of those circumstances to weave together something that's absolutely astounding. I mean, they end up in Egypt because Herod's going to kill the children. And so they end up in Egypt, and it says, Thus was, this was written to fulfill the word of the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Now, the message of that is pretty incredible because why would a nice Jewish couple with a baby go down to Egypt? Would you think they would do that? No. And yet they are obedient to that. They are not knowing that at that point, literally a prophecy about the Son of God is being fulfilled. And when Matthew's readers heard that, that quote out of Egypt, I have called my son, inside they would go, this is the Messiah, a new exodus is about to happen. Because Joseph and Mary were willing. So the question is, are you willing? Are you willing to be a part of God's divine plan for your life? Are you willing to be open to divine appointments? Do you, or do you really want to settle 
for a life that's merely based on survival and trying to be good. It doesn't have to be that way. You can get by that way. You're still a Christian. You'll go to heaven when you die. But you'll miss out on the joy. You'll miss out on the adventure. You'll miss out on the incredible opportunities in the midst of your family, friends, and neighbors right here that God might want to use you in a way that will absolutely astonish you. <laughs> I have to tell you, if it was just about survival and being good, I wouldn't be standing up here. There are better ways I could spend my time. But this is the best. Because I get the opportunity to say, come on, let's step out together and see what God might do. If you're willing, that's the invitation. To share the divine life. That's literally what these people are saying they are willing to do. And you will make a commitment in this service, in the liturgy, to reaffirm that yourselves. I would encourage you to keep it to heart, not just make it words that just sort of fall out of your mouth because that's what the prayer book says. But that instead it becomes something that's deep within you, where you really say deeply within you, we will. We'll do this by God's mercy. And then see what God will do.